Thank you for listening to Crosslink Community Church Podcast. If you would like more information about our church, please visit our website at www.crosslinkchurch.com or join us in person on Sunday mornings at 1020 a.m. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss a single message and share with a friend. Thank you again for listening. It's good to see you all. Thank you. One of you. Thanks. Man, we, uh, we are in our table series. Uh, for me, my family, it's gone, uh, gone well. I, I hope it's been an encouragement to you. And uh, we're going to continue this week in that. We're going to see Jesus once again dine with someone else. And, uh, and I think it will um, m- maybe allow us to sit under the weight of God's truth and grace this morning. Um, there's a lot that we're going to work through here this morning, and, and I will caution you. Um, I find it to be a, a, a weighty, a heavy uh, thing, um, because no matter how you shake this up, um, there has always been and will always be this tension that's built between Christianity, the gospel message, and religion. Christianity, the gospel message, and what we would call relativism. Uh, Christianity and the gospel message and what we would describe as uh, our cultural ideas and norms. There is tension there. There will always be tension there. Uh, there used to be a day and time, you know, some of you may remember, a few of you in this audience are older than, than me. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we, here's, here's do anyone remember going to public school and opening the class with prayer? Anyone remember that? Okay, so a few of you. Uh, you remember that moment, a uh, public school setting, you stood up, probably did the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag, and then, then all of a sudden, bow your heads, close your eyes, let's pray, uh, and you, you did that. So, so here's what happened. There used to be a time in our culture at which um, the culture adapted or uh, borrowed or instituted Christian core values um, that um, were more of a moral code or a common code that was just intrinsically taught in different institutes, whether it be in school, uh, whether it be what we watch on television, like there seemed to have been at one point in time a common overarching Christian moral code. Now, I'll say this. um, Anyone remember Saved by the Bell? (laughs) Some of you like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, How about Home Improvement? Like, okay. Okay, (laughs) please. (laughs) No, we don't need that this morning. All right. How about uh, um, Family Matters? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Full House? Uh, Yeah. So in all of these TV shows I just described to you, what ends up happening is that there is this kind of um, uh, uh, theme that happens where you have what seems to be the good people. They uh, screw up in some way, and there's a lesson taught at the end of it that good people don't do this, or when they do do this, they kind of kind of circle back around to it. If you remember in Home Improvement, any of these shows, there was a moment where it created tension, and then there was a lesson that was taught. You watch TV shows anymore. And you'll be hard-pressed to find a moral lesson taught. Now, here's what I'm going to say. This Christian core values that we used to have, um, I'm not arguing we need to go back to that. Because I'm going to be very honest with you. Having a common moral code without a regenerated heart creates wickedness. So we don't need a moral code, just good lessons to be taught if the hearts aren't being redeemed and reconciled by the person and work of Jesus Christ. All right, so, so I'm not saying we need to go back to that, but I will say that things have changed. Correct? Okay, thank you. Uh, so here's what happens. Um, I was having a conversation with a, with a person who uh, ran a, a hotel the other day, and this person said that you can't imagine the things I witness at a, at a hotel. I'm like, I'm sure I can. 
imagine some things uh, that, that do take place at, at a hotel. And, and so I started to think about a moment that, that I had um, uh, when I stayed at a hotel. In fact, um, my wife and I, we were doing a wedding uh, over in Amish country area. Um, this was several years ago. And, uh, and they put us up in this hotel. And so we have the night to, to ourselves. And I say, I'm going to go down to the hot tub. She's like, go for it. Because she doesn't like the hot tub, but I do. That's, that's where I live. So I go, I go down there. And for me, it's like this moment of relaxation. Um, and I just, I just want to just, you know, I, I'm normally a talker, but there I just want to not talk. I just want to just rest and relax. And I get down there and I'm sitting in this hot tub and I'm resting and relaxing and a couple other adults there. And all of a sudden this kid comes in the door and there's no parents. And there's a sign that says, you know, children can't swim without supervision. I don't think that was created for kids safety. I think it was created for the other adults sanity. All right. So this kid, instead of jumping in the pool and swimming and having a good time, he comes to the hot tub and he jumps in the hot tub, which I don't think is etiquette. Either way, he jumps in and I'm trying, I'm trying to relax, right? Just, just kind of decompress. And, and he's a, yeah, it's a train. Uh, yeah, he, he, he's a talker. You ever met one of those kids that incessantly talks? Yeah, he was that guy. And, uh, and so I, and I like kids usually sometimes. I like my kids at least. And so what happens is I'm sitting in this hot tub and, and, and he's, just, he's just talking and talking and then he gets closer and he's asking all questions and I'm, I, I'm getting irritated. Just to let you know, like, I, I, this is, I'm just being honest for a moment. I was getting very irritated. Um, like, hey, you want to meet Jesus like right now? Do you know who he is? I, I baptize you in a name, hold him down. I don't know. Like I was just in that moment where uh, he was bothering me and, and he was asking all the other adults in, in the hot tub. He's like, Hey, what room number are you in? Like, I don't know how you answer that. Like, I'm, I'm going to give him the wrong room number, and he'll be bothered someone else. But either way, like, this is that moment. And, and I, I don't know um, if you've ever had one of those moments where no matter how hard you try, the thoughts that you have, the intentions that you have are less than pure. You ever had that? The one thing that we have done really well in our culture is pretend to be okay. We do, we do really, we, we look pretty on the outside when we're dying on the inside. And Jesus is going to address that with us. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 11. That is where we will begin. Um, Jesus is invited um, to another house to dine with the Pharisees, and we'll walk through that. Um, but I, I think we need to do a little bit of work before we get started, um, because I'm going to kind of put against each other today this concept of the gospel message, what Jesus is stating in religion. Religion, even under the guise of Christianity, is the greatest adversary of the gospel. Uh, it wreaks more havoc and causes more harm than licentiousness or loose living or sin itself. I, I say that because sin was paid for at the cross when Jesus absorbed all of God's wrath towards humanity when he paid for it all. But religion was the catalyst that put Jesus on the cross. If you remember how this played out, and we'll see it here this morning, is that Jesus' interactions with those who were broken and sinful was one of compassion and kindness and truth and grace, but the interactions he had with those who were ultra-religious was one of, um, well, it was in stark contrast. And and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and all the important people of the day use their positions and authority to manipulate the situation to get Jesus to the cross. And still today, I would argue um, that religion is the greatest adversary of the gospel. Um, there are two categories of people in this world, just two. Here's what they are. Those who are broken and know it and those who are broken and don't know it or refuse to admit it. Every one of us in this room are broken. Some of us figured it out, sometimes through our own introspection, and sometimes, a lot of times, through our own failures. But then there's people, maybe even in this room, who still pretend that they're not broken. And here's the thing. Jesus came to heal the sick, 
He came to reconcile those who are far from God. And until we get to a place where we understand I am sick and I am far from God, then we'll never experience the true reconciliation that Jesus brings to the table. And so that's what we see uh, today. Um, let's, let's differentiate between the gospel and religion real quick before we read the text. Um, all religion, all religion at its core belief is this, all of it. You can, you can dial it down to this, that obedience leads to acceptance. That obeying grants favor or obeying a certain way or conforming a certain way will make God, whoever that God is, pleased and happy with you. That if you do X, Y, and Z, things will go well for you and God will be happy with you. If you don't do X, Y, and Z, God's angry with you. And I don't know about you, how many of you have lived your lives thinking that most of the time God is frustrated with you? Anyone want to be honest for a moment? Right? Like, man, I just can't get it right. Like, he keeps looking at Jeremy. He's like, man, when are you going to finally get over this? I'm like, man, I'm trying. He's like, nah, you're out, you scoundrel. There, listen, when God rescued and redeemed me, he knew everything about me prior to saying you are rescued and redeemed. Nothing will ever cause him by, or uh, catch him by surprise. He's not like, oh, man, didn't see that coming. You're out. I am thankful. I am thankful that Jesus knew me to my core when he said or offered to me reconciliation. Now, with that, uh, it's important for you and I to identify that religion is obedience leads to acceptance. Um, Because most of us, when we hear even the word religion, we think of all the major or minor religions that we've been taught about or told about. But if conforming to an idea or, or obeying a set of rules will give you happiness, you will find yourselves entrenched in our modern-day cultural religion. Um, let me explain it. Um, if you believe looking a certain way, doing a certain thing, gaining certain status, or having certain things will make you happy or make someone else happy with you, th- this is the core of religion. You have just made a person or you yourselves or any God um, happy with you if you follow the right path. You become your own God by bending and conforming to the newest cultural trends and ideals or the new cultural whims have become your God. Um, There's this thing pushing and pulling on our culture. It's called religion and it's called relativism. And what ends up happening, I would contend, I would argue that religion and relativism are um, really uh, two different sides of the same coin. Religion says do X, Y, and Z, and all things will fall in order for you, and God, whoever that God is, will be pleased with you. Relativism says you go ahead and be your own God. That's cool. You can do that. You just find what truth works for you, because not all truth works for everyone. So you just, you just try out certain ones. If that truth works for you, then you go with it. It may not work for someone else, but it can work for you. And so you pick and choose which truth is yours. So what you have here are two of really the same things on different sides of the coin. Religion, obedience offers acceptance, relativism, you, your own God, you pick and choose whatever works for you. These two ideas have been pushing and pulling on our culture for a long time. And unfortunately, they have infiltrated themselves even within the church. Um, Religion will always say, obedience precedes acceptance. But the gospel says, Jesus' obedience gifts us acceptance. And being accepted first will then lead to obedience. Religion says that uh, conform to these patterns of behaviors, look good and clean and pristine on the outside. The gospel is God chasing after the heart, not the behaviors. God knows once he has the heart, the behaviors will follow. And when the behaviors don't, or they're changing slowly, or they seemingly are at standstill, his grace is sufficient. And when you truly feel the weight of his amazing grace, that you don't have it all together and he still loves you, that you still struggle with your sin and he still calls you the child, that even when you wander, he is there. You lean into him more knowing that he is the safest place for your broken heart and your ever-fluctuating obedience. There is a difference 
between religion and the gospel. One is a safe place for the heart. The other one, the other one will destroy it. So, you ready? I got the mic, so let's go. Luke chapter 11, starting verse 37. We'll read through it, and then we'll go back and take it apart. It won't take me too long, just two hours. Verse 37, while Jesus was speaking, while he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went and reclined at the table. I find it interesting. Um, Pharisees, just so you know, we have a negative connotation when we hear Pharisee. Uh, but in that culture, they were uh, of great importance. They were preeminent. They were important individuals in that culture. They didn't carry around with them a negative connotation. Maybe there are people who didn't like them. But for most of the time, when they entered into the room, people were aware of them and paying attention, except for Jesus. When they entered into the room, Jesus just kept talking. And so the Pharisee, while he was talking, interrupted him and said, why don't you come eat with us? Let's get away from all of these low people. Why don't you come to my house and eat? And so this Pharisee invited him over, and Jesus went to recline at the table. Verse 38, the Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, "Um, now you Pharisee, cleanse the outside of the cup, and of the dish, but the inside you are full of greed, wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. Um, We'll just take this a few verses at a time. It starts out with, the Pharisee was astonished that Jesus did not wash before Eating. This is not, if you're any kids in the room or people don't like to wash their hands, this is not an argument for you to not wash your hands before you eat, right? You can still do that. It's okay. Uh, Jesus, Jesus didn't wash because what was going on um, was this was a ceremonial washing that was extremely important for religious procedures. The Pharisee that invited him over was astonished that he wouldn't do what was necessary according to their guidelines and culture. Like they were rocked by this, astonished. And I find it interesting, if you were here a couple weeks ago, that Jesus went to a Pharisee's house and they didn't offer him any water to wash up then. Now he goes to another Pharisee's house and the guy's like, why don't you use the water I offered you? Like, it's just strange. It seems like there's something going on here. Religion always has an agenda. Jesus always wants the heart. And so right here, they are astonished by what's going on. um, And Jesus didn't do this ceremonial cleansing. And so they're blown away. Um, Now, it doesn't make sense to you and I because, well, we don't have some of these rules and guidelines. So let me me bring it down to our uh, understanding, I guess. Uh, It's that moment where you're, going to uh, the store after church and you're walking and you see someone and uh, someone who was at church, you like, you just at church with them. Like, oh man, I know them. And then you go pass by and you see that they have, they have beer in their cart. Uh, that awkward moment, you don't talk about it. Uh, and then you move on. And the other person walking away is like, did you, did you see that? Like, that was astonishing. They just came from church, and they already got beer. Oh, okay, maybe that one just said, let's do this. Um, you arrive to the movies to watch Fireproof, the second release. <laughs> okay, so the, I just tried to use the most Christian movie I can remember, right? Fireproof, you go. You're like, man, yeah, this is awesome. You go in to the movie to watch Fireproof, and as you're walking in, you see someone from your church who's going to watch Harry Potter. Or some rated R movie that didn't have anything to do with Jesus. You're like, they're only as holy as we are watching Fireproof. (laughs) Listen, you've all felt this tension. Let's be honest for a moment. You watch someone else and then like, ah, that's, we have different set of rules. You want to talk about that? Let's do parenting for a moment. You invite some friends over and they bring their kids. And you're like, get these hooligans away. They're crazy. Like, do you not parent? Let me give you a book. 
It teaches you how to parent. And you're like, we parent our kids so differently than them. And so they leave, and they leave your house a wreck, and you're like, this is insane. And so what ends up happening is you talk about it with your wife. Maybe, how do we, how do we like, we'll pray for them, um, that they become better parents, right? This is what happens when people don't follow the same set of rules that you have set in place or that you think should be there or that some church told you should be there and you're like, ah, that kind of goes against what I've always been taught. You shouldn't have tattoos. That's weird. That's strange. That goes against the gospel. And I'm telling you that that's not what the gospel was about. The gospel was about your heart. In church, in some way and somehow, has turned it on its head and made it about your behaviors. This is not what it's about. I think it's safe to say, like, listen, I have done, and I, I know it's dangerous to say certain things from up here, but um, I have done more ministry, had more deepening conversations that weren't superficial with a group of guys having a cigar than I do going to a Bible study at church. It happens. Like there's something that happens when the walls come down and you're like, okay, let's get down to what this means. I feel like we're trying to be pristine when maybe what we need to do is say, you know what, I'm not okay. I'm, I'm not where I need to be. Maybe what we need is a little bit more honesty. Um, unfortunately, it has been my experience that most teachings in churches today are centered around conformity and not the blood-splattered cross of Jesus. Rules instead of grace that most people are told to try harder and do better and to look like this, and if you don't look like this, then there's something drastically wrong. Listen, if your first reaction to someone who, whose behaviors are not to the same standards as yours is of judgment and confrontation instead of of compassion, I would contend that you are more in love with religion than Jesus. When what we long for is a pattern of behaviors, when someone who approaches us is broken and hurting and sinful, I think what we should do is respond out of compassion because it seems to be what Jesus does. But let's look and see how he responds to those who seem to be better than everyone else. He says, now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but the inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did you or did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. The Pharisees spend all of their time and energy looking pretty on the outside. They crushed it when it came to external righteousness. If you and I were to compare tallies to a Pharisee, we would lose. When it came to the external righteousness, they crushed it. But Jesus sees right past the veneer that they've created. And they spend all this time to look righteous and holy, but they are dying on the inside. Do you know how often people come to church looking right on the outside, but really on the inside they are dying. And then all of a sudden, three months, three years later, you find something out that a marriage broke apart, that a person took their own life. Because what happened was they conformed to what they thought was needed to look the part, but they were dying on the inside. And I would contend that maybe we need to say, hey, my life's a mess. But Jesus is at work. That things are falling apart, but Jesus is working to help clean this up. Um, I get tired of playing the religious, religious games. In politics and church, the everything that is around that. And here's what happens. Jesus continues, uh, uh, verse 42, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. 
These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over you without knowing it. Um, he goes on this verbal lashing towards the Pharisees to let them know um, that they tithed all of this stuff. They tithed it, but they neglected two things, and that was justice and love for God. And I don't know if you saw it. He did say, he said uh, right here, uh, these you ought to do. So, so Jesus does say you should tithe, like he said it there. I don't know if you saw it. Just, just I didn't, He didn't say don't do that. He just, he says these you ought to, okay, so let's move on. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others, M- meaning this. They did all the right actions, but they didn't love people and they didn't love God. I would say that the the core of religion is doing all of these right things and not caring about the people in front of you. And that's what they did. They didn't care. They didn't love people. Um, It is very difficult to love people well when you think you're the highest, highest person in the room. Instead of being available to the poor in spirit, those who are longing to be introduced to God, they position and posture themselves in the best seats of the house. You know how people get upset in churches when their seats are taken? Anyone? Anyone been to a church? Someone got upset because someone took their seat? Some of you got here early for tables. I saw it. I'm not saying whether you picked the same spot or not. I'm just saying. It started here. The Pharisees would go into the synagogues and they would fight for the best seats in the house. They wanted people to see how important they were. And I think, um, I think what we need more of is people taking the posture of, hey, how can I love and serve you? Not how can I be better than you? Churches would look a lot different if we hated our own sin more than we hated the sin of those who were judging. That maybe what we should do is this introspection. The last thing that Jesus says to the Pharisees in this moment is that he tells them that you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. Jesus tells them that they are actually causing people to be impure that when the people listen to them, interact with them, follow their teachings about how to be close to God and seen as pure, it's actually making them impure. They are pushing people further from God instead of closer. So then this guy speaks up. Look at verse 45. One of the lawyers answered him, a teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. <laughs> Yeah, that was the point. He got it. He probably should have stayed quiet, though. He probably should not have spoke up because now Jesus is going to attract, his lashing is going to go towards this guy. Um, Should have stayed quiet. Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. Look what he says. He said to you, woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with your fingers. The lawyers, also known as the scribes, were part of the uh, Pharisee party. Most of them were. And what they did, they were in charge of interpreting the law. Interpreting the law so that those under their teachings would know what to do to get closer to God. And what they ended up doing was interpreting the law in such a way that it created burdens instead of lifting the burdens. It made it harder for people to get to God instead of easier to get to God. And Jesus is like, why did you push people away from God? You gave them burdens that you yourselves would not even even carry. Verse 47, woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers. They for they killed them and build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who 
perish between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. You guys know that most popular picture of Jesus, where he has long flowing hair, and he's like pretty and pristine. And what we have done in our culture has made Jesus pretty and pristine. And it seems like in this moment, he's pretty fierce. I think there's a ferocity to his love. I, I think he loves so well that he wants to take it deeper than maybe we're willing to go. I, I think what he's doing in this very moment is letting those around him who are listening in saying, you guys have pushed people away instead of brought people to. And he wants it to be clear, a clear distinction between what religion does and what his messages are doing. And I think we need even clearer distinction today. Um, because unfortunately, it is our natural proclivity to go back to the same things. Over and over again. Verse 53. As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. I don't know um, how you grew up in church or what you've been told or heard. Um, but I think through this series, what we have seen is an incredibly compassionate Jesus who looks at those who understand that they are broken and offers grace, love, and truth. And then he looks at people who seem to have it all together and culturally speaking, seem to have it all together and he says, you're actually further from God than closer to. And don't you find it interesting that it seems to be that those who always take the position of being the closest to God are also the ones who keep people away from him? Like, like I, I want us to be a people who recognize what Jesus is doing here and says, listen, maybe, maybe what it's always been about is Jesus chasing the heart. Maybe what we need to do is uh, allow Jesus to be att as attractive as he is and continually point people to him, not to behavior modification. Um, to be raw and honest for a moment, we would take a bunch of teenagers to uh, this mountain in Tennessee for a worship retreat. And I'd have conversations with these teenage boys who battle on a daily basis with, with lust. Daily. Like, like the, the one thing about teenagers is if they have your trust, they, they confess all things. And so we have many conversations and uh, trying to get um, a 16-year-old boy who f fell in love with Jesus to battle all the things that the culture throws at him. Like to help him walk through that is insanely difficult. But that's what we were called to do. And so we're there um, trying to help him navigate that. And he's like, man, before getting here, it has all these battles of lust. All this was going on. And then we're up on this mountain for a week long. And at the end of the week, these are the conversations that we had. Jeremy, I don't know what's happened. I don't know what's going on. But man, I haven't struggled with lust since we got here. And it's not because we've been trying to work on him changing his behaviors. It's because we brought him to a mountain with one purpose. One reason. And that was to meet with, dine with, pursue, and worship Jesus. And when your eyes are fixated on him, it's amazing what things that you struggle with start to fade to the horizon. And I think what we need more of anymore is putting Jesus front and center in churches and saying, listen, it's not really been about your obedience. He perfectly obeyed on your behalf. It's never really been about your faithfulness because he was perfect in his. What we need to understand is that you lean into trust in the one who was perfect in your imperfectness. And then when you lean into that, it's okay not to be okay. Just don't stay there. When you finally lean into that, what ends up happening is that his grace and his mercy overwhelm your heart and mind. 
We'll, we'll do it this way in my conclusion. I've used these verses before, but I find it to be beautiful. God spoke audibly twice in the Gospels, like audibly so everyone around could hear, twice. Once at his baptism and once on the Mount Transfiguration. When God spoke twice, he said, said the same thing. I don't know what he thinks about humanity that he had to say the same thing twice. Nothing new, same thing. He's like, you get this right before I give you anything else. And so he gives the same thing. And this is what he says. He speaks audibly at his baptism. That verse didn't go up on the, on the screen. It says, behold, a voice boy from heaven. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God speaks from heaven and he lets you and I know who he's pleased with. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Says it again at Mount Transfiguration. The reason why I tell you that is because if you want to know the answer to the question that religion tries to get you to, what makes God pleased with me? What do I need to do? It's not what you need to do. It's what the one he is pleased with has already done. How do I get God pleased with me? Trust Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Turn to Jesus. Embrace Jesus. Pursue Jesus. Because it seems like scripture tells me that God is pleased with who? Who's God pleased with? Jesus. Okay. So then there's this other verse. Um, Colossians 3, verse 3. This is what it says. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. For you have died, and your life is hidden with who? Your life is hidden with who? God is pleased with who? Your life is hidden with who? God is pleased with who? So God is pleased with you and I as we are in Christ. That is a beautiful thing because you can't earn it. I can't earn it. There are not enough good deeds that you and I can do to earn that position. What happens is we put our faith and trust in who Jesus is. We die with him, resurrect with him, and our lives are hidden in Christ. And now God looks down and doesn't see all of my mistakes and all of my failures. What he sees is Jesus and me just trying to hang on. And then when I start to slip, he reaches down and grabs me. But there's something else that I think is important. It's never been about the behaviors, it's about the heart. And when God has a heart, he starts to work on the behaviors. But he says something in, verse, in chapter 12 that you need to see, and then we're done. I promise. In chapter 12, verse 1, same kind of conversation. He just moves on his way. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together, when so many thousands of people had gathered together, they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, for which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and whatever you whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Anyone ever grow up in like Southern Baptist roots back in the 80s and 90s? Yeah, so I remember hearing this taught and it terrified me. You know what I mean? Like, like this verse, that whatever you have said in the dark will be in the light and whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops? I don't want that. Like, I don't think you do either. Can you imagine? Can you imagine, like, you come here next week, you say, hey, Scott, the handsome bald one in the back, Scott, come here. And then you come up here on the stage and all of a sudden on this big screen in HD behind us is all the thoughts and intentions and things you whispered in private start going up here on the screen. That'd be terrifying, would it not? If all of your whisperings went up on the screen, 
for everyone to see? And I was always taught that that's to kind of make you not whisper things in the dark. Well, the problem is fear doesn't do that. I still whisper things in the dark. And I'm like, oh, I hope no one heard that one. I think what's going on in this text is Jesus is looking at the disciples and saying, listen, here's what the Pharisees do. They live in hypocrisy. They hide things. They're not who they say they are, so they will be exposed for who they really are. Don't be like that. So how do you combat that? He teaches the disciples for the next three years that he's with them that community is what starts to defeat sin in your lives. That if you don't allow the things to be whispered in the dark and you pull someone aside, listen, I've been struggling with this thing. I can't shake it. I love Jesus and I'm pursuing him. But for some reason, this thing in my life, I can't get rid of. And you start to lean in on other people that God has placed around you and start to share those things with them. I promise you this, those things will start to break away. But in Christianity today, what we have done is we've made this thing so private that we don't want people to know that we struggle. And I'm here to tell you, every one of us in this room has a deep, dark struggle that if we shared, we'd start to see chains drop. But we're told to stay quiet. And so, so here's what we're gonna do. Um, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you struggled with. I don't know what's been on your heart and your mind. I don't know if you have chosen religion over Jesus. Maybe your relationship with Jesus hasn't been solid for a while. I don't know. But what we're going to do is provide a space for you to be able to listen to what it is God has to tell you. Um, and I want to be the voice that reminds you that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, your life is hidden with him. And that should be overwhelming. Like, why has that gotten hold? Why does that not just want to cause us to worship right away? That my, my, li my life, my wretched, sinful life is covered by Jesus? I think it should stir within us, moving away from religion and towards Jesus. So we're going to do a song, and during the song, this is for you. It's allow you to pray, to pray, to sing, to kneel, to come forward. We'll have people up here who want to pray with you. Whatever you need to do in this moment, I'll pray, and we will conclude. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you for doing the work on our behalf, for showing us things that Jesus does to engage and call the hearts of humanity. Father, I pray that we just listen right now, whatever it is that's going on in our lives and in our hearts, the things that we have chosen, maybe the behaviors that we can't shake, can we just, just use this moment to turn our eyes on to your son and allow you to do, to do the work that you have longed to do. We relinquish control right now, and this is for you and about you. Thank you for listening to Crosslink Community Church Podcast. If you would like more information about our church, please visit our website at www.crosslinkchurch.com or join us in person on Sunday mornings at 1020 a.m. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss a single message and share with a friend. Thank you again for listening.